Welcome to the Differential Gene Expression module and in this talk we're going to learn about different aspects of genes. We will first learn about the different parts of the gene and then we learn about regulatory elements of a gene that include promoters, enhancers, and silencers. Now, differential gene expression is a concept that helps us to explain how the cells in the same organism are different from one another. An explanation that allows us to understand why cells of the same organism are different is due to the expression of a unique combination of genes in the cells of the body. There are certain postulates of differential gene expression and the first one states that every somatic cell nucleus of an organism is going to contain the complete genome that was established when the egg was fertilized by a sperm. And what this basically states is that the DNA of all differentiated cells in an organism is identical. The unused genes in differentiated cells are neither destroyed nor mutated. So every cell in the organism has genes that are not necessarily used by the cell. And when that happens, those genes are retained and they have the potential for being expressed. Another postulate is that only a small percentage of the genome is expressed in each cell of the organism. And a portion of the RNA that is synthesized in each cell is specific for that cell type. This brings us to the concept of regulation of gene expression, which basically means that there has to be ways to determine what genes are expressed and which ones are not. So the way regulation of gene expression can occur is through differential gene transcription. This process regulates which of the nuclear genes are going to be transcribed into nuclear RNA. Another way of regulating gene expression is selective nuclear RNA processing. In this process, it is regulated which of the transcribed RNAs are able to enter into the cytoplasm and become messenger RNAs. It should be noted that in eukaryotic cells, transcription occurs in the nucleus. However, the RNA that is transcribed has to be transported to the cytoplasm in order for it to be translated into a protein. Another mechanism of regulating gene expression is selective messenger RNA translation. In this process, the type of messenger RNAs present in the cytoplasm that have to be translated into proteins is regulated. Or in other words, not every mRNA present in the cytoplasm is translated. The cell can control which ones should be translated and which ones should not. Finally, another way of regulating gene expression is differential protein modification. A protein can sometimes have to be modified in order to remain functional. And hence, we need these protein modifications and this is a way of regulating protein function. DNA codes for the information that is needed to synthesize a protein. So based on the central dogma, the DNA is first transcribed to an RNA molecule, which is then translated into a protein. Now let us first look at the different parts of DNA that comprise a gene. So for this, we are looking at first the DNA, and as an example, we are taking the beta globin gene. The part that is in the black box is the part of the DNA that will actually be transcribed to form RNA. In order for transcription to occur, there has to be a promoter that is upstream to the transcription start site of that DNA. And this promoter enables the enzyme RNA polymerase to bind to DNA so that transcription can occur. 
in the DNA, there is a transcription initiation site, which is the point from where the RNA will start being synthesized. The way we have a transcription initiation region, there's also a transcriptional terminator region, which is a set of DNA sequences that allow the RNA polymerase to determine when to stop transcribing that DNA sequence. Now, when it comes to translating the DNA sequence that codes for the protein, the part that is shown in the black box is the part that can have all the information to form a protein. In order to form a protein, there has to be a translation initiation codon, which is the ATG codon. The way we have an initiation or a start codon, there also has to be a terminator or stop codon. There are three main types of stop codons, and one of them is the TAA, the others are TAG and TGA. Now when the DNA gets transcribed, we get RNA, and the process is called as transcription. Now the RNA, in the case of eukaryotes, is called as the nuclear RNA, and it has to go through certain changes before it can be formed into messenger RNA. These changes include adding a five prime cap at the five prime end of that nuclear RNA, and a poly A tail at the three prime end of that nuclear RNA. What should also be remembered is that nuclear RNA have intervening sequences called as introns, and these introns have to be removed to form the messenger RNA. Thus, after the nuclear RNA is processed, we end up with the messenger RNA, which has the five prime cap, the three prime poly A tail, and the introns have been removed. Once this messenger RNA is formed, it is transported outside the nucleus of the cell into the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, translation can occur in order to form a polypeptide chain. Now this polypeptide chain will then undergo post-translational modifications and folding mechanisms to end up with the three-dimensional protein. For a gene to be transcribed, there are regulatory elements that are present. These are DNA sequences that control the expression of the genes, and these regulatory DNA sequences are present on the same chromosome as the gene. Hence, they are called cis-regulatory elements. We're going to look at three such regulatory elements, which are the promoters, where the RNA polymerase II will bind and transcription will be initiated. We're going to look at enhancers, which are DNA sequences that control the efficiency and rate of transcription. And we'll also look into silences, which are DNA sequences that prevent the promoter use and inhibit gene transcription. So let's first look at a promoter. The promoter is the site where RNA polymerase II, which is the enzyme that is responsible for the transcription of all messenger RNA in eukaryotes, binds to the gene, and this is where transcription initiation occurs. Promoters are normally present upstream from the site where RNA pol 2 initiates the process of transcription. Promoters are usually rich in what we call as CPG islands. CPG islands are basically stretches of DNA that are rich in the sequence of C followed by a G. The proteins that are called basal transcription factors are able to bind to CPG rich sites of DNA, which is usually present in the promoter, and can recruit the RNA polymerase II to start the process of transcription. Enhancers are DNA sequences that control the efficiency and rate of transcriptions. They can aid in transcription through the use of proteins called transcription factors that have the ability to bind to the enhancers. 
The transcription factors can activate gene transcription by different methods. In the figure that is shown below, we can actually see that the enhancer is shown in a green color while the promoter is shown in red color. We can see proteins bound to the enhancer as well as the promoter. These proteins are basically transcription factors. In the case of enhancers, the transcription factors can activate gene, expre uh, gene transcription by recruiting enzymes that loosen the nucleosomes in the area, but they can also loop the chromatin so that the transcription factors on the enhancers can be brought near the promoter. When we look at the figure to the right in panel B, we can now see that the green colored enhancer is closer to the red colored promoter and the transcription factors bound to the enhancer and the promoter are contacting each other due to the looping of the chromatin. In the small blue box, here we can see that, that the interaction is actually necessary for transcription to happen. In some cases, a group of proteins called as the mediator complex act as a bridge between the enhancer and the promoter. The mediator complex is made up of 30 protein subunits and plays a role in recruiting RNA polymerase too. If we look at the figure below in the blue box, we can see the mediator that is shown in these blue circles that is bound to an enhancer. The mediator aids in the formation of a pre-initiation complex where it can bound to the transcription factors or the basal transcription factors that are bound to the promoter as shown in the blue box below. The interaction of the mediator with the basal transcription complex is stabilized by a protein called cohesin. For transcription elongation to occur, the mediator complex must be able to dissociate from RNA polymerase too. As we can see in the figure below, you have proteins, for example, TEC, that can disrupt the interaction of the mediator with the RNA polymerase II and allow the RNA polymerase II to progress along the DNA to help in transcription to continue. If the association between the mediator complex and RNA polymerase II is not broken, then we have a pause in the transcription as shown in the blue box. In this case, the protein NELF does not allow the mediator to dissociate very well with RNA polymerase II and basically does not allow RNA polymerase II to continue with the process of transcription. So now that we've learned about enhancer sequences and how they aid in the process of gene transcription, we'll now look into the process of how to identify whether a DNA sequence can function as an enhancer. In order to do that, what we need is we need our DNA sequence shown in the red box that we think may be an enhancer. And what scientists do is they fuse it with what we call is a reporter gene, which is a gene that we, whose gene product we can observe. In this case, the reporter gene is the green fluorescence protein that we can visualize due to its fluorescent patterns. So by fusing the DNA sequence and the reporter gene together, we can get, as we've shown in the figure below, where they are right next to one another. This DNA sequence is then injected into an embryo and we monitor the expression of GM, GFP in the embryo as it develops. In this case, in the figure below, we can actually see the GFP is expressed in the eye. 
And thus we can say that our DNA sequence that we attach to our reporter gene it functions as an enhancer that is important in eye development. Another way of identifying whether a DNA sequence can function as an enhancer is based on the principle described in the previous slide, except that our reporter gene is no longer GFP, but the LAC-Z gene. The LAC-Z gene codes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase. In this case, the DNA sequence is attached to the LAC-Z reporter gene, and this fusion DNA is then injected into the embryo, and we monitor the expression of beta-galactosidase in the developing embryo. And what we can see, as shown in the figure below, is wherever a blue coloration is found is where the expression of beta-galactosidase is. And so in this case, we can actually see the expression of our beta-galactosidase in different portions of the embryo that allows us to say that this DNA sequence that we attached functions as an enhancer in those specific tissues. We are now going to look at the concept of enhancer modularity. Now since all cells of an organism have the same DNA all cells will have the same enhancer sequences too. Now transcription factors present in the cell determine whether a gene is active or not by binding to the enhancers present in the gene. Let us take an example of gene A that is shown below. Gene A has two enhancer sequences. One is the blue brain specific enhancer and the other is the green limb specific enhancer. Now let's look at a scenario where we, these enhancers are used. Now in the case of the first figure that is shown below, we can see that if there are proteins or transcription factors that have the ability to bind to the brain specific enhancer, then their binding will cause the chromatin to loop around and make a contact with the RNA polymerase at the transcription start site and result in the transcription of gene A so that we can observe the expression of gene A in the brain. Now even though in this scenario the limb specific enhancer is present, unfortunately those cells are not making the transcription factors that can bind to the limb specific enhancer. In this case the limbs of the organism are not making it and hence we do not see the gene A being expressed in the limbs. However, when we look at the last part of the figure or the bottommost part of the figure, in this scenario, the limbs of the organism are able to make transcription factors that bind to the limb specific enhancer. However, the brain cells are not making any transcription factors that can bind to the brain specific enhancer. Thus, when we look at the limbs of the organism, which are making the limb-specific transcription factors that can bind to the limb-specific enhancer, we are able to see the expression of the gene in the limbs. Once again, just to reiterate, in the case of the embryo shown in the bottom-most panel, the brain cells are not making any transcription factors that can bind to any of the enhancers, and thus, even though there is a brain-specific enhancer present, it is not used and hence we cannot observe the transcription of gene A. In order to give you a real-life example of such a gene, we're going to look at the PAX6 gene. The PAX6 is a protein that is a transcription factor which is expressed in the eyes, the neural tube, and the pancreas. As we will see throughout the course, PAX6 plays a very important role in development. 
there are many enhancers that are present upstream of the gene. As we can see in the figure below, there is a pancreas enhancer, a lancin cornea enhancer, and a neural tube enhancer, as well as a retina enhancer that is within the gene. When we look at the expression of PAC6 in the embryo using uh, the techniques that were described before, we can observe the beta galactosidase activity in the eyes and the pancreas. Thus, in this particular gene, the different enhancers are used in the different body parts to mediate the transcription and expression of the PAC6 gene. Another thing to remember is that the enhancers have regions of DNA that can bind to more than one transcription factor. And thus, the presence of the different transcription factors is essential for gene expression. For example, when we look at that PAC6 gene that we saw before, we had seen that it has a pancreas enhancer. When we look at the pancreas enhancer in more depth, what we observe is that the DNA sequence that forms the pancreas enhancer has a binding site for two different proteins. One is called PBX1 and the other one is called MACE. Thus, we need both PBX1 and MACE to bind to the pancreas enhancer for the expression of the gene. And this is called combinatorial association. Only when these two transcription factors are present together does PAXIS get expressed in the pancreas. Now let us look at the example of another gene, which is the crystalline gene. In this case, when we look at its enhancer DNA that is shown in green towards the right part of the figure, we can actually observe that it has binding sites for PAX6, SOX2, Delta EF3, Delta EF1, and LMF, all of which are transcription factors. For the expression of the crystalline gene, all of these transcription factors must be present on the enhancer DNA for the expression to occur. Thus, combinatorial association is often necessary for the expression of genes and is a way to regulate gene expression. We're now going to move on to another DNA regulatory element, which is called as the silencers. These are DNA regulatory elements that will actively repress the transcription of a particular gene. Now, gene expression can be silenced spatially, which means it can be silenced in specific cell types, or it can be silenced temporarily, which means it can be silenced at particular times for example, during development. Now, how do we know that a DNA sequence is a silencer? And for that, what we can do is we can once again use our principle of using the beta galactosidase gene that will be linked to a DNA sequence that could act as a silencer. And we look at the expression of beta galactosidase in the developing embryo. Now in this case, as shown in the figure, the NRSE sequence is a sequence that we think might be a silencer. Now if we don't have the NRSE sequence, as shown in the figure below, we can actually observe a lot of beta galactosidase expression in the embryo as shown in the blue colors of the embryo. If we compare that with the embryo at the top, we don't see a lot of expression of beta galactosidase basically indicating that the NRSE sequence can act as a silencer and it silences the expression of the LAC-Z gene and hence beta galactosidase is not made. With this, we come to the end of our talk where we learned about the different parts of a gene and the regulatory elements that control gene expression. And these include the promoters, enhancers, and silencers.